Great. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We are excited to learn about influencer marketing in Canada from our consultants um, at Argyle PR. Um, and before they get started, I just wanted to share a few things from SESTA. Um, and actually, before I even do that, I would just like to remind everybody that you're muted. Um, that's just to cut down on all the background noise. But if you have questions um, throughout the webinar, please type them in to the Q&A or the chat, and we will address all the questions at the end. Um, all right. And my name is Danielle Coco. I think I have spoken and emailed with just about everybody. Um, but if not, nice to meet you. I'm the marketing director at SESTA. Um, and I wanted to mention that our export readiness training starts next week. This is our third training. Um, we started this during COVID and it's a, a very thorough virtual training done over Zoom. It is conducted over four classes um, and they're three hours long. So, I mean, it is an intense course that is meant to teach companies, you know, the A to Z, the fundamentals of exporting. Um, so if you are someone who has, um, who is ready to export, but really needs to learn some of those basics, we have one spot left. Um, so really exciting. We, we see the, this training filling up as a, a bellwether of things to come. So we are super happy that companies are excited about this, but we'd love to fill it up entirely. So if you are interested, um, you can register on our events page. Um, it's it's right there. And like I said, it's coming up next week. And then um, the other three classes are in October. So we'd love to welcome you to that. Um, and then real quick, I wanted to mention on topic with this webinar, how companies can use our 50% cost share program to support things like um, hiring an influencer in a foreign market. Um, so for SESTA, as you all know, we help companies in the southern U.S. export their food and agricultural products internationally. Um, one of our programs is the cost share program where we reimburse 50% of certain international marketing expenses. This is the full list of expenses that we can reimburse. Um, and I have highlighted that first one, advertising, um, which includes hiring a uh, PR marketing, you know, digital marketing firm um, in a foreign market, and that can include influencer marketing and, you know, hiring somebody who has that large following um, and just making sure that they're targeting um, a foreign audience. So um, if you are learning things today and this is something you really want to pursue, please keep that in mind that we can support uh, your efforts in that. And then um, for the Can Canadian market, we have our friends, our consultants at Argyle, who help us uh, put on our events in Canada, uh, meeting with Canadian buyers and importers, distributors, um, and you know, also offering their expertise and uh, as a resource for webinars like the one we're doing today. So we really, really appreciate their support, and we all lean on them uh, quite a lot for uh, getting our U.S. products into Canada. And I'd also like to mention that the USDA has offices in Canada as well, uh, in Montreal, Ottawa, and Toronto, and they are also great resources. Um, these are folks who are working on behalf of U.S. agriculture in Canada. Um, they're writing the gain reports that we send out. Um, you know, they're keeping on top of all the you know, regulatory issues and things like that. So as you have questions about this market, these are um, our two greatest resources that we have in Canada. So I would like to introduce our two speakers today. We have Matthew Stradiotto and Ben Walters. Um, Matthew has over 20 years of experience in this. He's the uh, vice president and general manager of digital communications at Argyle. And before joining Argyle, he was the co-founder of Matchstick, which was one of the main main boutique agencies in Canada that specializes in social media marketing and digital marketing engagement. And then Ben joined Argyle in 2019. He's on their digital team and has a focus on social media strategy and influencer marketing. He's worked with leading brands like UPS and Johnsonville, and we're excited to meet Ben today and, uh, and hear from um, both of you. So I will go ahead and turn it over. Okay, thank you, Danielle. And we're just going to do our screen share here. I think if you stop sharing, Ben can jump in here. Thanks, Ben. Um, so hello and good morning, and thanks so much for joining us today and really 
you know, we do appreciate you taking time out of your busy morning to listen in. As Danielle mentioned, my name is Matthew Stradioto, and we do have a pretty full agenda today. Our intention for the next hour is to take a very close look at influencer marketing partnerships specifically, and really offer some strategic thoughts from our side on executing these partnerships with success. So our agenda is to maybe start out with some terminology. We want to look at the sort of cross-section of influencer terminology that's out there and really try to help clarify some of the terms and descriptors for this wide group of people we call influencers. We're going to take a look at the platforms that are used by influencers in 2022. And then our intention is to get a bit more granular on the process of developing and running an influencer partnership campaign for your company or your brand. And that's going to include looking at three areas, how best to identify influencers, how best to work with those individuals, and then, of course, how to measure the outcomes of these types of programs. Um, and Ben and I are planning to save some time for questions, likely as we get close to the top of the hour. So maybe just a quick, quick background. Danielle mentioned, you know, that we're from Argyle. Um, you know, Ben and I are members of Argyle's digital team, and Argyle is an agency now, one of the pro the largest actually privately held communications agencies in Canada. We are in seven cities in Canada, um, over 150 staff, and we also have now an expanded footprint in the U.S. with a new office in Washington D.C. And as Dan Danielle mentioned, you know, Argyle has a very strong agribusiness and trade practice in Canada. And that's a group that's really proud to be a representative of SUSTA. Argyle is the Canadian in-country consultant for SUSTA. So let's start um, by taking a look at influencer marketing. And, you know, I did want to preface our thoughts today with just an early note that this area of influencer marketing is, of course, maybe much more meaningfully aligned to those who already have a presence within a market. You know, ideally, that would be in the form of in-market distribution, um, where you're more likely to generate tangible returns from the effort of influencer marketing. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll get into some of those details. And if there's actual questions about that, you know, when to get this going, when not to get this going, we could certainly save time for that in the Q&A. But we know it's very likely that none of you are new to the concept of leveraging influencer voices for your business. This idea of influencer marketing, it's really been around now for more than 20 years. And it's a tactic that has been over that time, you know, tested, refined, and certainly matured by even some of the biggest names in consumer marketing, whether we, you know, talking about Adidas or Pepsi or Nikon, um, or even the US and Canadian political parties, influencer marketing is, is here to stay. And it's really intrinsically tied to social media marketing. And that's because influencer marketing, it stems back to the rise of the social media platforms globally, certainly in the US, certainly in Canada, and that kind of level setting impact that the rise of social media platforms had. And that was really to give individuals the same publishing and distribution and creative opportunities as these so-called giants of advertising. And you know, here we are in 2022. I think what's important for us to acknowledge is really the rise in popularity of, of this tactic, you know, so much so that influencers themselves have arguably almost as much control, almost as much clout, and are certainly generating as much attention as the media channels that they rely on for their success. So let's take a quick look at some statistics here. Um, you know, by success, we, you know, that may actually be an understatement. We took a look at some recent trend data, which today suggests that, you know, spending in this area of influencer marketing may reach even beyond the $17 billion mark into 2023. And that's, that's globally. It's a huge investment. Um, and it's really fueling a few things. It's fueling new platforms, 
the cloud-based tools that empower influencer marketing to happen. And it's also empowering significant confidence among marketers, digital marketers, traditional marketers, many of whom say that they plan to continue to look at influencer marketing as they do their planning ahead for the coming year. So a very big, um, big part of many marketing plans. Um, and on the next slide, you know, it's worth pointing out that this continued optimism and growth has been almost so significant that, you know, we wanted to point out a trend here. That confidence has given birth to even a new, arguably extreme layer of influencer in the form of fictional or fabricated personas which today exists entirely within the digital realm. So if you're not familiar with this, I'm talking about this new myriad of either Instagram or now even metaverse-based virtual influencers that are proving to generate you know, the same opportunities, the same benefits as their human influencer counterparts. It's a bit of an extreme movement, a bit of an extreme trend. But I, I wanted to point this out because... Um, in fact, this idea of a virtual influencer may help us kind of home in on what the real benefits of an influencer partnership might actually be. If a completely digital alternative to real life influencers can exist, you know, we're asking ourselves, well, what does that say about influence and clout and the impact of these potential partnerships in the first place, you know? what actually is working well in this kind of dynamic digital landscape that we have to market within. Um, so maybe as a first step to help answer that, we thought we'd look at the wide range of terminology that's associated with this influencer movement. So on the next slide, you know, when we took a look at the sort of breadth of terminology that's used to classify and describe influencers today, I think at the very least, it can be confusing. We have thought leaders, brand ambassadors, micro influencers, content creators, you know, even celebrities, of course, are, you know, definitely well within the mix here. And also now what we might call nano influencers in case um, you like your influence, you know, at the very smallest level um, today, there are, there are influencers called nano influencers. And you know, Argyle has a very specific approach to navigating this perceived diversity. And that's um, to ultimately consider what is the strategic value of the more meaningful influencer marketing terms. So when we look at value, um, we really can acknowledge that there's a spectrum of voices, a spectrum of potential partners under this umbrella of influencer marketing. And related to that spectrum is the correlated benefits that you might generate for your brand or for your business. So digging into that a bit, influencers, you know, starting with the most common term that's used today, influencers tend to be considered valuable because of the audience or the social media following that they have. And, you know, through that following, um, the access to that unique audience. Um, and then we look at the term brand ambassador, which refers to those who have value because of their close and constant proximity to a brand or to a company itself. You know, that really affords for the viewers an inside access or inside perspective that would be, you know, peppered with, we hope, deep knowledge of the product category. And then to turn to thought leaders, these would be the even deeper experts because of their you know, connection to uh, a body or to an industry and their value stems from, from thought leaders, their value stems from an independent, possibly nonpartisan perspective on the topics that they lead on. And the category of thought leaders would of course include you know, people like authors of books, um, authors of articles, and this area can even intersect with um, academic or the science community. And then I mentioned celebrities. Um, you know, the celebrity connection is is well developed, and of course, 
celebrities are often sought out by organizations for their fame, for their influence. You know, they have large TV, film, and digital audiences. And, you know, Argyle typically regards this area of influencer marketing as having its own distinct nuances and protocols and paths and possibly pitfalls. Um, so we tend to group that celebrity piece under its own distinct area, which we're not going to get into today, which we might call celebrity marketing or celebrity endorsements. But finally, to kind of bring this terminology to a focus, we come to a term which we at Argyle really prefer to use most often when we think about meaningful and successful influencer marketing programs. This is the content creator. Um, and I want to pause here. We, we really like this term. And it's not because the other influencer types don't have a role to play. Um, it's more so because the majority of our clients, and I'm going to assume that that even extends to the audience today, um, for most of our clients, the term content creator really captures what we should be focused on when thinking about influencer partnerships, and that is meaningful, authentic content. So it's our pretty strong recommendation that when you think of the value of influencer partnerships in terms of um, you know, what you might get from it, you turn to the new and the engaging content which creators can deliver to your marketing plan, and that is photo content, video content, written content, all generated through the lens of a real or thoughtful or engaging and creative personality who's willing to work in partnership with you. And ideally, of course, echo your business's core values and your business's core marketing messages. So even frankly, above other variables such as the size of an audience or the fame or the clout or even the promise of, you know, something more, um, our recommendation right at the outset is that for influencer partnerships, you put tangible content delivery and content output at the center of these programs. And so for this reason, from here forward, Ben and I are going to refer to these individuals as content creators. And to kick it off, we wanna to turn to the platforms where content creators are having you know, impact in 2022. And I'll turn that over to Ben. Excellent, thanks, Matthew. Uh, yeah, so before we get into some of the main kind of breakdown of strategic considerations for content creator partnerships in 2022, we wanted to break down um, where the market's at today in terms of platform strategy. And so as brands and individual marketers continue to evolve their understanding of the digital landscape and the differences between platforms, the time in which marketing teams put, you know, activated across all social platforms for the sake of awareness or, you know, reach or kind of other unquantifiable uh, metrics like that are very much over platforms just like marketers continue to evolve, change, and diversify themselves to attract audiences and provide unique value propositions ahead of their competitors. And so we see here uh, an Aspire 2022 survey found that various key brands are seeing an increase in investment um, targeted at specific social platforms and a divestment from other social platforms in the market space. Notably at the top here, we see Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube leading the way in terms of brands shifting dollars towards strategic investment in content creator partnerships or ad buys on these platforms. And in parallel, shifting away from other platforms like Facebook, Snapchat, and Twitter. One thing uh, I did want to bring your attention to with this is that, you know, obviously we continue to hear TikTok everywhere around us. Every meeting we walk into, someone's proposing a TikTok strategy. Um, and so it's notable to, you know, consider that 74% of brands are, you know, reporting an increase in investment on the TikTok platform in 2022. And for, you know, a social network, social platform that was, you know, introduced to the North American market within the last four years, this is absolutely something, uh, you know, that can't be ignored, a very significant wind shift in direction of brand strategy. 
And so with that said, Matthew's going to expand a bit more on the rise of TikTok in the Canadian market today before we move into our strategic considerations section. I'll pass back to you, Matthew. Thanks, Ben. So yes, I think, you know, today for us, when we talk about influencer partnerships, um, TikTok is always in the mix. And we wanted to just take a bit of a, a side moment here to consider the this amazing growth that Ben is referring to. You know, for us today, um, this platform is almost a new de facto leader in the content creator ecosystem. And so we want to we want to underline why that is, starting with user growth. So you know, there really couldn't be a steeper user growth curve here. The pandemic, of course, was good for accelerating mobile usage among consumers across Canada and certainly also within the U.S., but it was very good for TikTok. You know, this is a platform that while, you know, still today it's only about half as big um, as Facebook from a monthly active user perspective, it is, you know, it, it arrived at this 1 billion global user mark three times faster than either Facebook or Instagram did. And there is a bit of a trend here. You're going to see TikTok mimic and copy overall the approach that Instagram has taken with um, allowing marketers to connect with creators, but they're certainly doing it at a much faster pace. And then on the next slide, if we look at a revenue perspective, you know, TikTok has reached a revenue mark within six years, which took YouTube 14 years. You know, that's less than half the time, you know, and it's it's likely that YouTube is, is today almost TikTok's only remaining competitor in the mobile sort of view, mobile video viewing space. And then on the next slide, we'll look at TikTok against time spent. So TikTok here out punches the darling Instagram by three times in terms of monthly hours spent per user. And then this is kind of interesting looking through the content creator lens, you know, unlike any other social media platform, which today um, most social media platforms are kind of dominated by viewers of content. Most of TikTok's community today are actually creators, content creators. And that's a fact that translates to this kind of staggering statistic that there are 700 times as many content creators working on TikTok than there are professionals producing content in the film and television industry worldwide. It's a staggering amount of content production. And, you know, this means dollars and cents for TikTok. So um, the projection is that in just two years, um, the forecast will be that TikTok will have exceeded both Facebook and YouTube in terms of influencer spending by marketers. And, you know, this for us adds up to this kind of important platform to consider for content creator partnerships, at the very least being aware of it and, and testing it um, because it is in every way catching up to Instagram in importance and should be probably in the top two or three considerations when considering working with content creators. So I'll pass it back to Ben. Excellent, thanks, Matthew. So just speaking to some of the evolutions we've seen from platforms like Instagram and TikTok, very much reflect one of their key audiences, uh, which isn't actually users so much as it is marketers. The you know agencies or individuals putting dollars towards ad buys, content creator partnerships, are one of their key audiences in terms of attracting them onto the platform. And so what we've seen very much is an evolution of the functionality that these platforms offer to cater towards marketers, to content creators. Um, and this comes in a couple of ways, uh, you know, specifically with Instagram, we see the rolling out of branded content ads which has taken what would normally or in the past have been, you know, an organic post with the content creator being paid and just, you know, adding a hashtag to disclose that it was a paid post. Um, now having built in platform functionality, which will cite under the post that is a direct paid partnership with XYZ brand. Um, and you can go so far as to actually have collaborative posts. So it'll appear in the user feed as a post from two accounts, one, the content creator and the paid brand. Um, and so this is very much, you know, an evolution of functionality from what we've seen in the past, which was a much more ad hoc approach to content creator strategy on platform. 
And the same is true with TikTok. Uh, I know Matthew, myself, and many of our colleagues were anxiously awaiting the uh, rollout of Ad Suite um, for TikTok to see how they were going to introduce it into the market, what the limitations would be. Um, and it's still in a very new um, early stage, but you know we anticipate these platform functions specifically on TikTok to continue to evolve um, both in competition with their competitors in the market space and to appeal you know, to marketers and ad buyers like yourselves. So moving into the strategic consideration section of our presentation today, um, my hope with this section really is that we can kind of walk you through at a high level from top to bottom, what a content creator partnership will look like step by step, going from sourcing and identification all the way down through to metrics measurement and reporting. Um, but before we get into those kind of step-by-step -step slides, I just wanted to, at a high level, note what the importance is in achieving an impactful and meaningful content creator partnership. And a couple key elements go into this that are reflected both on the content creator, the, part, the brand partner, that would be yourselves or the clients that we represent, and the connection between your audiences. So starting with authenticity, um, is this content creator authentic within their own content strategy and brand narrative? Are they aligned with the values of your brand and the audiences you share? And is there a connection point between your two audience, whether that be in terms of demographics or other things like that are less quantifiable, like general sentiment um, or disposition? All of these things in connection um, will take your content creator partnership that much for, farther towards achieving the goals of your campaign and maximizing the return on your investment for content creator strategy. So you're sitting at your computer, you're looking for a list of influencers to create a new strategy promoting your latest product launch or brand strategy, um, whatever it may be. There's a ton of different ways you can go about sourcing prospective content creators um, that both agencies, individual brands, in-house marketing teams all employ um, in the pursuit of implementing these strategies. A couple that we wanted to share with you today is one manual research, um, you know, just getting into some desk side research in Google or on social platforms can come in a few key ways. Um, notably, some of the most common approaches that we take or that many businesses take will be, you know, tracking key hashtags related to your product or you know, industry space relevant to your conversation to understand who the most notable people are using those hashtags. You can also you know, conduct specific keyword searches, whether that be on Google search or on platforms specifically um, to understand and follow conversations related to your brand. Reviewing tagged UGC, um, you know, many of you are familiar in platform, a lot of social networks like Facebook or Instagram, uh, you know, users can tag your brand in content that they're publishing. So looking through that, seeing who some notable people might be that are already, um, you know, involved with your brand and directly tagging you on platform, uh, whether that be in the pursuit of looking at a partnership with you from their perspective or whatever else, it's a great way to understand, you know, who is from a notable like macro or micro standpoint looking to engage with you as a brand on platform. And then finally, um, you know, auditing competitors, keep an eye on who your key competitors are leveraging in this space, what content creators they've worked with recently. You can tell or that they're prospectively potentially looking at in terms of tagged content or otherwise. Um, you know, all of these in combination will likely provide you um, a broad list that you can begin to narrow down in terms of prospectively looking at who you'd like to partner with for content creator strategy. So uh, just briefly expanding on the second option available to you is platform assisted. I'm sure many of you have heard names like uh, hashtag paid, but there's other platforms out there that are oftentimes paid. It's a licensing fee that you would pay either monthly, annually, comes in a variety of forms. Um, but these platforms offer a lot of functionality in terms of creating efficiencies in your 
you know, creator sourcing process, identifying specific content creators you like to partner with, reaching out to them or their brand teams, um, and going so far as to managing campaigns or creating re metrics reports for you. Um, these platforms like Clear, um, specifically, for instance, the one our agency works with most commonly, have full suite functionality um, and can offer a lot of benefits and increase your efficiencies in terms of leveraging content creators for your marketing strategies. As I noted, these are paid platforms for the most part and prices may vary, um, but we definitely do encourage you to check them out. You can have demos done for free. Um, their you know, sales reps will show you exactly what they can offer. And from there, you can negotiate what a contract between you and them uh, might look like. So whether it be, you know, through a platform or manual search method, you've identified a list of prospective creators that you'd like to partner with. Um, but how do you narrow this down to actually a small handful of individuals that will be most valuable towards your campaign strategy? Well, that comes through um, what we like to emphasize is a data-driven data approach to understanding audience engagement and content. Starting um, with audience, you know, looking through their platform metrics to determine if their audience demographics are a match for your target audience, whether that be in regionality, you know, in Canada versus the United States, age range, um, and a variety of other demographics, ensuring there's an alignment there is a great starting point to narrow your search list and ensure you're going to be getting content in front of the right people. Now, looking beyond that at engagement, um, this one can be a bit more challenging to quantify, particularly comparatively against other creators. For instance, if you have a creator with 10,000 followers or 1,000 followers, um, understanding how their engagement lines up is a bit challenging, particularly because the scale is so different. Um, but there are certainly ways you can calculate this uh, from a relative standpoint and benchmark against other creators to inform your decisions. And then looking just generally at their content, um, you know, does it align with your brand aesthetic, the values you hold? Um, is it of high quality, well composed, and optimized for the platform in which this creator is activating? All of these things should be considered when you're deciding um, amongst your list which ones you would actually like to partner with, you know, send contracts to and begin a relationship with from a content creator brand partnership perspective. One of the key um, aspects in any creator partnership, as I'm sure all of you know, is contracts. So the first step in reaching out to a content creator is a proposed contract or partnership agreement. And oftentimes clients um, or even you know, our internal team members will ask us what they need to include in these contracts. And understandably, it certainly can vary, but it comes down to four key section elements. Um, the first being an overview of the partnership, you know, a summary of the brand background, your campaign goals, and what the success benchmarks are that you've defined. Second to that is the specifically the proposed activity. So a uh, detailed breakdown of the work request, um, including your ask, key messaging, copy or verbiage, um, the themes that you'd like to convey, product features, activation, timeframes, compensation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these are all critical aspects to any contract, but it will explain to the creator exactly what you're asking of them. And then supporting that as well is the key brand messaging. I mean, you know, if you're paying these individuals to go into marketplace, promote your brand or your new products, and you want to convey specific messaging, um, you know, note that specifically. If there's something you need them to convey in caption copy or over a video, reel, whatever it may be, cite that specifically in the contract and brief. And then finally, um, like in any legal contract is associated consent signatures of all parties involved, signing into the clauses of the agreement and the contractual obligations therein. And the key part of any contract or relationship with the creator is compensation fees, as I'm sure you can imagine. And there's a lot that goes into this, um, you know, tons of variables that we can't even cite in their entirety here, but uh, today we'll go over just a couple key factors that will inform how much you would decide to, you know, provide for compensation in a contract. And many influencers, whether they're managed by an agency or content creators, sorry, whether they're managed by an agency or acting independently, will not really charge a flat rate. Like I said, so many variables go into determining compensation. 
And some of those include the reach and engagement on average of that creator's content, their audience scale, so the number of followers they have per platform, the channels that you'll be activating on, whether that's one platform, uh, you know, for instance, Instagram, or you're activating across multiple of their brand channels, you know, Facebook, Instagram, extending into YouTube, all of these things can influence uh, the associated fees. And then, you know, the type of content you're asking them to produce is also a key factor, whether that's an in-feed post, that's a static asset or a video, or more simply a couple Instagram stories. It's going to, you know, raise or lower the associated cost. Um, paid promotion. So if you're going to be actually putting paid media spend behind the content you're asking them to produce, uh, there may be additional licensing fees for that or multimedia platform fees that will be baked into their compensation expectations. And finally, um, as I briefly touched on, if they are managed by an agency, um, you'll likely also see a markup uh, for agency fees kind of as their uh, as their managers, as the ones, you know, acting as an in-between between you and the, uh, the creator and themselves. And uh, so just for further learning, as I did say, there's a ton more that can potentially go into us. So in the notes of this slide that you'll be provided, I believe we also included a link to Influencer Marketing Hub, which has a much more detailed guide on, you know, how to kind of prospectively price compensation fees. So before we shift into measurement and metrics, uh, just a couple other considerations I wanted to cite for you today that didn't exactly fit into any of these uh, the previous steps, but usage rights at the top, um, you know, who actually owns the content and over what time period will be an important consideration within your contract. Um, you know, do you actually own the asset that's being produced? Is ownership retained by the content creator? Or are you, for instance, licensing this content over a certain time period? And when that period ends, do you no longer have access to it? Paid amplification, as I briefly spoke to before, can influence compensation fees within a contract if you intend to put paid media dollars behind it across various platforms. Um, another key factor that a lot of brands specifically are very aware of is exclusivity. You know, the process, you don't want to have a creator partnership in market, and then they're also providing content, you know, to your immediate competitor. It's never a good look. And so things like exclusivity can be stipulated within contracts. There may be fees associated with that, but you can, through that process, ensure, you know, they're not going to be working with your competitors either during the activation or in the immediate time following. And then finally, um, production. So just basically citing exactly what's going to be uh, produced in terms of creative assets, whether it's video versus static. Um, will there incur harder costs associated with this purchasing stock imagery or buying physical products or props? All of these things uh, will kind of go in and inform both the contract and the expected compensation of the content creator. All right, moving along at record pace. I know we've gone through a lot already, but uh, I promise this section will keep it uh, succinct and high level. So before we go into kind of measuring uh, specific key metrics, I wanted to kind of break down um, the difference between two sides of the same coin uh, is quantitative metrics versus qualitative metrics. So when you're looking to establish any campaign, you wanna be putting together some KPIs um, that should be built before the campaign launches based on your specific goals or the objectives of the campaign. And so these quantitative metrics on social platforms can vary from platform to platform, um, but for the most part fall under impressions, reach, engagement, clicks, conversions, and web traffic, all specifically cited within, you know, the content performance metrics of a given business account on platform or a content creator account. Uh, but on the other end, there are certain metrics that aren't as easily measurable, um, but still play an important role in determining the success of your partnership. This is the qualitative side of things. So things like positive comments, engaged questions, user-generated content, and general audience sentiment can inform whether or not a piece of content has performed well beyond the quantifiable side of metrics reporting. And these can be a bit more challenging to track and integrate into your reports. Although we do encourage you to, you know, if you have a certain content creator piece in market, you know, keep an eye on the comments. How is it being perceived by the audience? What is their general sentiment? Are they engaged with the user? 
is uh, is the content creator, you know, engaging with them, replying to, perpetuating conversation. Um, all of these things go into fostering a deeper relationship from an audience to your brand and are definitely something that shouldn't be overlooked in the reporting process. And now the key aspect of any metrics reports and content creator partnership is determining success. So are you getting the return on investment that you are expecting? Is the creator meeting the KPIs that you've set out for your campaign? Um, so the last step after the creator has published content, your paid activation has ended its duration. You're looking to put together a report outlining the success or failure of your initiative. So some key performance metrics that I uh, briefly touched on before include reach, engagement, traffic, and conversion. Now, where you decide to prioritize these should be reflected of the objectives of your campaign. If you're looking to drive signups to a newsletter, um, you likely want to prioritize conversion. If you're looking to foster a more engaged audience on social platform, increase the amount of comments and UGC ad mentions and tags of your brand, um, maybe you consider prioritizing engagement in your tracked metrics. Um, but with that said, there are one key differentiation between the way we measure and understand metrics and platform. And that is the difference between organic and paid. So organic metrics are the things you see, you know, directly when you're looking at a piece of content, you know, the amount of impressions um, or likes it's received, the amount of engagements, uh, comments specifically, the amount of, for instance, let's say on Facebook, if influencers are adding a link to a website where they can go through and purchase a product, um, you know, the amount of organically like click throughs we've seen for that. And then finally, um, in a similar vein is conversions. But where things get a bit more technical is the paid side. And so paid metrics are um, not necessarily entirely different from organic metrics, but they are measured and tracked in a bit of a different way. And the way that's represented is also slightly varied. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard the endless list of acronyms that go into insights and metric supports, whether it be CPM, CPEs, CPCs, CTRs, the the list goes on, um, but uh, for your reference today, we'll just kind of briefly go through those. And so paid impressions um, comes in the form of cost per thousand impressions, which is CPM under the reach category. CPE, which is cost per engagement, uh, falling naturally under the engagement category, is the amount of comments or engagements, actions taken on a paid media post, um, or whatever other form of content you're in market with or on platform. Traffic through click-through rate or CPC is the amount of times a piece of content on a paid post has been clicked on or you know, engaged with when the user is going off platform following a purchase acquisition funnel or whatever else it may be, um, can be measured you know, what, either on platform metrics or for instance, if you give a specific creator a discount code, you can measure that through your own website to see how many uh, individual customers have been driven from that uh, piece of content with that discount code to your platform and to your product uh, website or whatever the use case may be. And finally is paid conversions leads, um, so cost per acquisition. So in a similar vein to traffic, this could be uh, newsletter signups. If you're looking to keep your audience updated on what your organization is doing, new products that are coming out, uh, fostering you know, um, a mail out campaign or whatever that may be. The direct signups, um, whether it be on platform or on your website, can be measured through conversions under CPA. And so, yeah, that's basically kind of the main uh, metrics that you should be aware of and keeping track of when reporting on the success of your campaign. Now, when we're looking at building a report, um, it's important to always keep, you know, the quantitative side of metrics included and measured in relation to what your priorities of objectives are. Um, but like I said before, it's also important to integrate the qualitative side of things where possible. And the template of your report is subject to exactly what your purposes are. It's entirely variable. There's no real cut or dry template for metrics reporting um, as far as a brand standpoint goes. Um, the platforms that I mentioned earlier, like Clear, will offer you pre-structured, um, automatically generated reports based on specific influencers, broader campaigns, 
providing um, you know, associated metrics and content performance. Um, and you can also combine that with the qualitative side of things, looking at the comments on platform, um, as I noted, and you know, going so manually as just screenshotting them, integrating them into your report, providing a high level summary of the themes uh, in terms of conversation that you saw. Um, and you can also go a step beyond this by actually tracking and quantifying positive or negative engagements and using that to inform the success of your campaign. And as I noted, I guess at a high level, the importance of these reports really is that you can compare the success of different creators within a campaign if one performed better than the other. You can, through that, define the success of your campaign and use all of this to inform future strategic planning, um, whether you'd like to move forward with more content creator partnerships um, based on the success or failure, um, or decide to approach from different strategies that obviously remains up to you. Um, but yeah, that's basically the main rub of the presentation today. So I'll pass it back to Matthew to uh, open up the Q&A. Thanks. And actually, um, Danielle, just looking at the time, we did one one section we had sort of reserved as a possible area here was a couple examples, actually, of some campaigns that, you know, Argyle has run in Canada. Maybe we'll just take a couple minutes and, and Ben, we could go through those, you know, on the quick side and then just given where we're at, maybe save 10 minutes uh, for our Q&A. Does that sound OK, Daniel? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So great. I think, you know, um, our team does execute a lot of content creator initiatives in Canada, and I think it might be helpful just to quickly illustrate that work. Um, we've brought today two examples of brand work that we do in this space. So Ben, do you want to quickly jump in on the first one? My pleasure. So starting us off today, a brand near and dear to my heart, Johnsonville Sausages. Um, I am the project lead for this account, uh, so it's quite close to home. It's a uh, small town brand from Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Um, but with that said, we work with them, um, you know, across a number of different uh, capacities, um, specifically and most commonly in digital marketing, managing all of their social channels. And so we have in the past activated multiple different approaches to content creator partnerships. Um, one of the most successful ones um, that I'll share with you today was in partnership with a Canadian chef, Chef Dev. So in the spring of 2020, um, you know, we're all in the midst of lockdown. Many people can't even necessarily leave their homes, let alone, you know, host large family barbecues, get togethers, um, which in the Johnsonville brand are key moments um, that we want to be a part of, that we want Johnsonville to be top of mind. And so to pivot our approach and create these moments, um, despite the lockdown requirements and isolation of, of COVID in 2020, uh, we skewed to partner with Chef Dev and host a virtual barbecue event, um, basically on Instagram Live, where participants could come in, see Dev prepare a number of different recipes, engage uh, directly with questions and commentary from the live audience, and facilitate, you know, a barbecue moment um, shared amongst our audience and our brand in an environment that we couldn't otherwise achieve it. So as I noted, we had Dev at his home with a simple setup, uh, you know, tripod, his own phone, um, basically framed around his barbecue. He had a set of key recipes, um, a number of key points that he was going to touch on throughout the uh, activation, and it was an absolute smashing success. He's a great personality on camera. Uh, we had a, a very high number of engagements coming in to participate, comment, like, and share the live event. So the results we saw, 92K um, impressions overall from the associated promotional um, and post-event content, 8K video views, uh, which was both before and like during and after the event. Um, so great overall uh, engagement from our audience. And then 9.5K um, commentary and direct actions taken from our audience during the live and after in the subsequent reels we published. And so since launch of the virtual barbecue event, um, impressions for male millennials, which is one of our prime targets, increased 15% overall from Q2 to Q3. Um, and for us, this was a great success. Um, the brand team was absolutely thrilled. It very much aligned with the narrative we were looking to create 
and was a textbook example of, you know, pivoting our strategy to keep top of mind in, you know, barbecue at home family moments that just simply weren't possible at that time uh, during COVID. And the next one today comes from a brand that I'm sure many of you know. Um, I'll pass to Matthew to take over. Okay, thank you, Ben. Yes, from Wisconsin, um, let's move to Easton, Pennsylvania, where Crayola is headquartered and they're, they're a client we work with closely in Canada. And in 2021, we were asked to consider um, a product launch for Crayola in Canada that had actually already arrived within the US market. And our, our task was to leverage the voices of key content creators really to kind of evolve this existing product conversation from simply a product focused narrative to a story with a more meaningful social focus. So um, we invested in a content creator program and, and in 2021, this was a moment in time when diversity, equity and inclusion was really a hot button topic. Um, you know, amplified by recent news, recent events, and, and some significant activism, you know, in North America. <clears throat> and, you know, it was and still is, of course, a moment when consumers almost expected brands to show up and walk the walk, as it were, uh, and when content creators almost had a heightened sensitivity to any brand in authenticity. So it was our insight in working with the launch of what's called Colors of the World, um, which was a line of crayons uh, and markers in Canada by Crayola. It was really to kind of lean into what inclusion means, which was at the heart of this product. And we created a driving theme that was entitled, You Can't Be What You Can't See. And so this was a program that engaged and partnered with content creators. Um, and we can jump to the next slide, Ben. Creators that even included um, Jagmeet Singh, who also happens to be um, a lead Canadian federal political party um, leader and who's a very outspoken individual on the topic of diversity and representation. You know, but each of our creators here were selected in Canada for their fit and their stance and, and had a meaningful voice. Um, demonstrated voice within the DEI conversation that we hoped would kind of drive that authenticity and connection to Crayola's product story in this case through their content. Uh, the results were, were, in our opinion, very successful. We had over 5 million, um, you know, Canadians reached. We had significant content views on our longer hero video message, over 36,000 views. And we generated, you know, completely a market value in terms of exposure of, of more than $300,000, which was even um, more than five times what Crayola had initially invested in this initiative with Argyle. And actually this campaign for our team and for Crayola won uh, global recognition um, in 2022. It won a global award of excellence um, from the IABC Gold Quill Awards, which is the International Association of Business Communicators. And then close to home, the Canadian PR Society um, gave this campaign an, a bronze award at their, their ACE Awards. And it, it won actually in the Canadian DEI Campaign of the Year category. So we were super proud of, of the results here. So um, just a couple quick examples that I know we, we've moved fast through those. Um, Danielle, let's turn it back to you and see if there are any um, outstanding questions or anything we can help clarify. And um, we can go right here, Ben. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So if anybody has questions, please type them into the Q&A or the chat. Um, and before we jump into that, um, you know, a lot of our companies are, um, well, they're all food and agriculture based, um, but a lot are small businesses who might be getting into a market for the first time. Um, and, you know, I guess in my thinking, you wouldn't go down the road of hiring a content creator until you're established in a market already, you've got distribution and you want to amplify your brand. But is that maybe short-sighted? Do companies ever launch into something like this before hitting market or as a way to like create the demand and then get in? 
Um, I think that's a great. I think that's a great question. Maybe I can jump in first on that, Danielle. And I and I, I did add that preface at the top that I think you know you can see by everything we've discussed today how you know complex these these partnerships can be to navigate. There's time. There's investment. I think our initial thought was you want to be able to generate a return, of course, from that step forward, and it would be difficult arguably to generate a tangible return if you didn't have a market presence. Having said that, um, you know, I've been working in this space for, for actually more than 20 years. And when it began, this idea of influencer marketing, a lot of it was aimed at the very nascent stage of kind of product launches. So um, I can recall intersecting with many programs where there was an interest in kind of getting the word out very early um, with you know, influential voices to almost generate that a bit of that pull demand instead of the push that that pull for um, consumer awareness, retail awareness. So I, I would I would say there is an application here for an early stage um, usage of influencer marketing. But I, I really want to caution that I think for most groups, most companies, this is something you layer in to something when you're when you're sort of in market, including including doing advertising and and pushing product out retail. Um, all right, we've had a few others come in um, to see results from an influencer or content creator. What kind of time frame should I expect? Happy to uh, take this one. So, you know, to compile your metrics report in a timely manner, um, as it's important to understanding the success or failure of a given campaign. You know, reasonably, you don't want to wait more than about a week maximum to um, to get the metrics reports from your creator from their specific platform and content performance. Uh, but what you can do actually is stipulate that within the contracts of your agreement. Um, you know, at the end of the campaign duration, content creator X is to provide, you know, a certain amount of metrics um, within this time period. So to ensure you get that in a timely way, um, stipulate that within your contract agreement. Um, and then I know it would vary by contract, content creator, et cetera, but more or less what kind of budget should be expected or invested when hiring a content creator? Tough question to answer, I would say, absolutely. Um, I'd hesitate to give a specific metric or figure to this because as I spoke to earlier in the presentation, there's so many variables that go into price and compensation fees for a creator, whether that's the size of their audience, the platform they are activating on, um, the number of content pieces you're hoping to get out from them. But there are a lot of resources online, um, including the guide that we link in the presentation that can help you quantify this. Um, they'll provide insight on, you know, what platform you're looking to activate on, kind of like general cost per thousand followers that you might be able to expect. So if you have a certain content creator in mind, um, you know, use the platform they're on, the amount of followers they have as a base to correlate with some of the general statistics you can find, you know, available from specific influencer guides or pricing guides. Um, so I won't give you a specific figure um, just to cover our own basis here, but there are a lot of free resources available to you to, to price that based on your own context. Great. All right. And last question before we run out of time, um, is there a specific website where we can find a list of content creators in Latin America and the Caribbean would that be like the clear? Uh, I'm happy to take this one as well. So yeah. as I mentioned, there are a host of paid platforms available for you out there that have proprietary databases in which you can search for specific content creators by, you know, geographic, where they're based in Latin America, for instance, the language they speak, um, the number of people in their audience that have that specific geographic as well. Um, so that's kind of on the platform assisted paid side of things. And there's also a manual approach you can take to this. Um, you know, even going so simply as searching that literally into Google. Um, many, you know, news outlets or various blogs will host uh, lists, kind of BuzzFeed style listicles of top 10 most popular content creators in X category or in X region. Um, so, you know, check out some of the resources we have listed in the uh, slide deck as far as manual research goes. Um, and just do some clicking around, some desk side research, and you should be able to reasonably find at least a, a set of prospective partners that you could look at working with. Awesome. Great. 
Thank you so much. Um, and thank you both for sharing all of this really interesting um, information. It seems like this is, um, you know, such a, obviously a growing method of um, brand amplification and it's constantly changing as we saw. <laughs> so thanks for the updates. And um, to everybody who has joined us today, I will be sending out an email with the recording as well as the presentations. As Matthew and Ben said earlier, um, the presentation, their presentation has a lot of the links and information um, that you know you can do a little deeper dive uh, using that. Thank you, Danielle. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Wonderful. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.